Hello and good morning everyone and welcome to one more lecture. Today is the first lecture of uh, nephrology or renal diseases and uh, to tell you the introduction to start with nephrology is the branch which deals with the uh, <clears throat> conditions which are related to kidney. So nephrology and urology, <clears throat> like urology is the one which basically deals with the, uh, urology is more surgical type of uh, field and that's what deals with the conditions related to the bladder, to the ureters, to the urethra, to the prostate, whereas nephrology is related to the conditions which are related to the kidney okay so <clears throat> one of the book you know which I follow uh, like uh, whenever I have uh, I have to prepare the lectures you know so I always just for a quick re revision so I just go and go through the Oxford handbook so in the Oxford handbook, uh, what you will you will see is on the first page they have written that the first artificial kidney uh, is basically a rotating drum type of artificial kidney, and this one was introduced in 1943 uh, by. Willem Koff, the name of the person, and he made that machine by using uh, a water pump from Ford and aluminium drum from the washing machine uh, from the from the war plane. Uh, as well as uh, it was the second world war time and as well as the washing machine parts and orange juice cans and sausage skins and what happened like 16 people uh, who get treated uh, by the first dialysis machine in this world you know 16 people would get treated and all of them they died it was in 1943 so, <clears throat> which is not so old, but why? Because uh, if you will see, you know, like as far as the human history we know. So, before 100 years, you can say, uh, in 1920, there was no concept about dialysis at all. I, I'm starting my story with dialysis, of course, because, you know, uh, <clears throat> most of the kidney conditions... Nowadays, the ultimate treatment is uh, basically either dialysis or transplant, kidney transplant. So in 1943, you know, during the Second World War, this, this thing happened and the 16 people who get dialysis from that machine, basically all of them, they died. But in 1945, two years after that, a 67-year-old woman her name was Sophia Mari Mar Maria and she was basically patient number 17 because the first 16 patients were dead and she was basically poisoned and the same doctor you know Willem Koff he reluctantly like because 16 people were already dead so this guy you know he referred that patient of poisoning uh, to the same machine on which 16 people were already dead. So her blood was passed through sausage skin tube, uh, basically this rolling drum which was uh, they took from a war plane, you know, a gun down war plane, the war plane that fell down, you know, they took that drum, aluminium drum from that. So. When her blood was passed through that and uh, they just put a salt water you can say 
in that drum. Uh, what happened? Like uh, 80 liter of her blood was treated in this way. 80 liter, like we have five liters. So what it means, like her blood was passed through that uh, that machine uh, <clears throat> almost 16 times. Okay, and when they did this, you know, they, they were like the success was to remove 60 grams of urea. And after 11 hours, she opened her eyes to declare that I'm going to divorce my husband. Because like her husband was the one who gave her the poison. So. This guy, you know, Willem Koff, you know who was the inventor of this one, he chose not to patent the life-saving machine or invention, but what he did, he donated it to a lot of, lot of the hospitals around the world. So again, like, uh, uh, first lecture is always an introductory lecture, right? So, what I'm showing you here is, you know, what is this one? The functioning... Uh, or the basic structural and functional unit of the kidney is called as what nephron and there is all around 1 million nephrons in the, in the kidney parts of renal corpuscular inter, internal view see there is proximal convoluted tubules and this one this one is connected to what like this is you know glomerular glomerulus formation like there is a efferent arteriole from where the blood comes and the blood circulates all over here and it goes through the efferent arteriole and there is this these are these are the endothelium cells of the glomerulus <clears throat> and this is like the layers of like the parietal layer of glomerulus glomerular which is called as the bowman's capsule okay this is particle, this is podocyte of visceral layer of glomerulus, Bowman's capsule. And of course, whatever is filtered go through the proximal convoluted tubule. And they now they are magnifying this part and showing you over here, podocyte of visceral layer of glomerulus Bowman capsule. And this is like the filtration slit, there is a pedicle. Okay, so this is how the basic unit of the kidney nephron looks like right this is how a nephron looks like so now the important thing uh, what we are going to uh, start is like of course this is the most basic structure of, of the of the kidney right nephron and uh, you guys all, 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 you guys had discussed like or have gone through all these things. Okay, like th this is just a revision, but uh, more uh, uh, from a clinical point of view. Okay. So, <clears throat> what is nephron? It's, it is a microscopic structure, and it is a functional unit of the kidney. Okay. And it is composed of up of what a renal corp, corpus uh, corpuscle okay corpuscle this one which I'm showing so it is made up of what a renal corpuscle and a renal tubule so this is the renal corpuscle and this is the renal tubule right so this is the corpuscle and this is all the tube right so <clears throat> The renal corpuscle is made up of what? There is tuft of capillaries, which is called as the glomerulus, and the Bowman's capsule, right? So Bowman capsule, capsule, and a tuft of capillaries. So now, um, the important thing, like the kidney have around, around 1 million okay by the way more than 1 million of nephrons and uh, 
the thing is that you know like if someone uh, so how many is total like 2 million or you can say 2 to 3 million totally everyone have so if someone out of those 2 or 3 million if 50,000 uh, sorry not 50,000 if you can say half million of them will will stay working you know that's enough to maintain the functions of the kidney okay and this is like the, the direction of the flow as i told you it comes uh, they come through the afferent and leave through the efferent so they come through the efferent arteriole they go to the glomerular capillaries and then they leave through the to the efferent arteriole's okay uh, by vasa recta and then renal venules so <clears throat> this is what is the main thing okay so of course like i'm not going to go into histology and all this stuff because um, like when the first lecture you know we have to just discuss the functionality of this thing and then we will move on so the important thing here is uh, uh, you can see that you know here they are talking about uh, basically uh, you can say the functions of the kidney right there's a cortex and there is medulla okay uh, I will tell you now what it means see uh, what they're showing is like they, they if if you will if you will take a cross section of the kidney so this is the uh, cortex this is the medulla so the glomerulus is in the cortex right and uh, the cortex there is glomerulus in which there is proximal convoluted tubules then there is loop of Henle and then there is distal convoluted tubule and then there is collecting duct and you can see over here uh, what they are showing is like you know this is the part where osmotic diuretics work if you're in pharmacology you have done the diuretics what are the classes and how they function so loop diuretics work here and then thiazide diuretics work here and then there's potassium sparing diuretics work here right and you can see what what is going on like the there is filtration going on organic acids and bicarbonates are re, like secreted back go back sodium chloride go back water go back glucose amino acids and phosphate and vitamins go back then what happens like water goes out at this part of the loop of family because this area is too much concentrated and you can see like there is potassium sodium potassium chloride atps okay and then potassium is entering in hydrogen is entering in sodium chloride is going out here water is going out and bicarbonate and then aldosterone works here okay so i don't know like uh, again how much you know about the basics but uh, <clears throat> like this is the basic uh, functionality of the kidneys right uh, you can say <clears throat> how the kidney work so uh, the thing is that uh, you know uh, there is active transport and there is uh, hormone regulated channels are there okay so active transport means what for example uh, which requires the ATP for example here the sodium potassium exchange is going on at in this level okay so that requires ATP okay but the sodium hydrogen which is occurring over here is basically regulated by angiotensinogen or aldosterone okay and uh, even the phosphates are regulated by uh, what you can say by the effect of hormones and then like the water goes out here without anything and then there's thick uh, loop of Henle and then there is thin loop of Henle okay and uh, sodium, sodium potassium ATPS pumps are over here as well. Sodium potassium chloride channels are over uh, here as well, which are also regulated by the effect of, they are under the effect of hormones. And so, 
it will be better for you to like go through the basics first. Sodium potassium channels are over here. Again, they are regulated by aldosterone. Okay. So all this one is, you know, they are regulated by aldosterone or ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Like this one you can see over here. They are showing like the ADH, ADH is attaching and antidiuretic and of course it is antidiuretic hormone. So more and more, more water, water will go out by aquaporin channels, right? So wherever this sign is there, which means it is regulated by, by the hormones. So what are the function of kidneys? Uh, again, the function of the kidneys. Water excretion is one of the function. And uh, uh, of course, like what is the mechanism? There is glo glomerular filtration. And much of that is uh, reabsorbed, of course. There is tubular secretion and there is tubular catabolism. So by glomerular filtration and excretion of nitrogenous products of protein metabolism like urea and creatinine and tubular secretion excretion of organic acids, urate and organic bases and tubular catabolism breakdown and excretion of drugs like antibiotic, diuretics and the hormones. So electrolyte balance is also a function of the kidney. As we know there are different channels, okay, there are different uh, uh, pumps which are acting, tubular sodium chloride, then tub there is tubular potassium secretion, there is tubular hydrogen secretion, there is bicarbonate synthesis and reabsorption, and then there is tubular calcium, magnesium, phosphate transport. So all these things of course like they affect the acid base balance as well as control the volume. Then hormone synthesis is also there. Remember, this is very important, guys. If you know this, this thing is a function of the kidney, then you would know, like, you know, whenever there is renal failure, what is going to happen with the patient? So, erythropoietin is one of the hormone which uh, <clears throat> makes the red blood cell or which stimulates the red cell blood, cell blood cell production then kidney is also there which it is activating vitamin D 25 hydroxy vitamin D is converted into 125 vitamin D in the proximal tubules and the third function is renin production so simply, kidney is the one which is playing role in RBC's formation. It is the it is there to make or it is playing a role in calcium hemostasis, and it is also a part of renin, angiotensin, norgen, aldosterone system, RAAS system. Kidneys also regulate the blood pressure by excreting sodium by renin production and it also play part or play a role in glucose hemostasis. Gluconeogenesis can occur in kidney from lactate, pyruvate and amino acids. Okay. But it plays a little role in this one, not too, too, too much role. One more function which kidney do is like it clear and degrade the circulating insulin. So th that's one of the way it also plays role in glucose hemostasis. That's also one of the function of the kidney. Not written over here, right? This one also kidney also clear and degrades circulating insulin. So glomerulus, guys, you know, it is the site where all the filtration is going on, right? And uh, as I told you, it has two parts. It has uh, uh, a form of what? That Bowman's capsule, okay? And 
and also like there is uh, glomerular filtration okay so basically the filtration occurs across the glomerular filtration barrier what are there there are endothelium cells there is gbm or glo glomerular basement membrane and there is bowman's capsule or space around that so uh, now particles are selectively filtered by size okay like anyone in which the size is you know less than 60 and the charge for example the negative charge particles you know they repel they go back so proteins <clears throat> that's why we don't lose proteins from the kidney because the kid the proteins they are not filtered by the kidney so the kidney have following cells you know mesangial cells are there you can see over here so what are mesangial cells these are basically structural cells that support the vascular tree okay and they are also contractile and they produce vasoactive substances that control blood flow also they have capillary endothelial cells you can see here okay so <clears throat> of course capillary endothelial cells guys as you know they are the one which are making barrier okay uh, the, these are the one by the way which are there and the blood cannot leak simply so they are also making barrier and help form the plasma filtration apparatus Okay, they are they are making the plasma filtration apparatus okay and uh, <clears throat> there is uh, visceral epithelium as well as parietal epithelium basically these protocytes are basically what uh, protocytes are visceral epithelium Okay. So these protocytes are basically what they are visceral epithelium. Again, see this one. These are the protocytes they are showing protocyte cells. Okay. So these protocytes which are there, they are what? They are the visceral epithelium. So these are the cells. Uh, again, they make barrier, you know, they help in plasma filtration and they are interdigitated interdigitated like this see look interdigitated okay like when you when you uh, like if you're sitting and your both hands are clinged together so you can interdigitate your your like with overlapping on the palms right on the dorsal sorry not on the palms so because of this interdigitated foots, you can see that there are slit like diaphragms. Okay. So, this is what I'm talking about. There are parietal cells. They, these are the ones which line the interior of Bow Bowman's capsule. Okay. And then there are um, juxta glomerular cells. And what are just glomerular cells? It is, these are the smooth muscle cells uh, which are lining the afferent arteriole. Okay. They produce, store, and uh, secrete the renin. Okay. So, just glomerular cells. We can, we can write, we can, uh, we can add up over here four number. Juxta glomerular cells. Okay, they they line the uh, there are smooth muscle cells and line the afferent arterioles, and they produce produce store and secrete what renin. So. I think like the thing will become clear to you now to you guys now. So these just are glomerular cells which are lining the afferent arterioles. 
these are smooth muscle cells so simply they can contract and they can relax okay and they are the one which produce store and secrete renin so that's how they control the renin angiotensinogen aldosterone system because they are the key cells here in the kidney okay you can see over here all the things which we have discussed here you can see over here juxtaglomerular cells lining the efferent arterioles then this is the Bowman space here this is the glomerulus the tuft of capillaries and this is the proximal tubule these are the endothelium cells these are the mesangial cells which are the supporting cells these are the podocytes visceral or epithelium visceral epithelium okay and they are showing the Bowman's parietal epithelium right? so <clears throat> now guys like oh, what is the thing by the way uh, actually what happens is like uh, the kidneys they receive 20% uh, of the cardiac output okay so what is the cardiac output cardiac output is stroke volume multiplied by heart rate and normally or uh, <clears throat> uh, you can say like if you will round off you know the cardiac out our cardiac output, output is around 5 liter per minute which means like the heart pumps 5 liter of the blood every minute right kidney receive 20 percent of that which means the kidneys they get one liter of blood every minute okay kidney receive how much one liter of blood every minute i'm talking about this one so we or you can say like 20 percent of the cardiac output that you receive right cardiac of which is around one liter 1000 ml or one liter is the same thing So, the GFR, which is the glomerular filtration rate, what is that? The rate of fluid which is transferred between the glomerular capillaries and the Bowman's capsule. So, the one liter of blood which kidneys receive every minute, okay, out of that, what happens? That the GFR is around 120 milliliter per minute in a healthy adult. Okay, which is around 170 liter per day. What you have to do? One if what you have to do, how we can calculate this? How many minutes in one day? 1440. So 120 multiplied by 1440 gives around 173 liters per day. So that is the amount of fluid which is which enters the proximal convoluted tubules do we produce 173 liters of urine every day we don't right we just produce around 1.5 liters of urine every day so 173 liters per day of the fluid which is fluid which is filtrated by the glomerular uh, glomerulus out of that 99% is reabsorbed so out of this 173 liter per day 99% is reabsorbed which gives us a daily urine output of 1 to 1.5 liter okay and high, which is highest in early adulthood decreasing thereafter so <clears throat> There is something called as you know, filtration fraction. Filtration fraction uh, is around 20%. So, <coughs> now, uh, you know, 
uh, what we were discussing is this one. You know, this is this is the afferent arteriole and this is the efferent arteriole. The blood comes from here, circulate all over here. A lot of that is filtered, and a lot of that is reabsorbed, and rest of the blood goes from here. Okay. The efferent arterioles get dilated in response to prostaglandins or the afferent arterioles get constricted in response of NSAIDs. Prostaglandins dilate, NSAIDs constrict. Efferent arterioles, under the effect of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, you know, it dilate. Under the effect of angiotensin 2, it constricts. Okay. So all these points, of course, like will, will become clear once we will, will continue and once we will discuss more and more uh, renal things. The renal tubules, of course, like the function is to reabsorb and secrete. Reabsorb and secrete. Okay. The things. So again, like all these renal tubules, you know, they are uh, uh, engulfed by Vesa recta. So all this reabsorption and secretion occurs basically between the renal tubules and vesa recta until, you know, the tubular fluid is transformed into urine for excretion. And each segment of the tubule selectively transport various solutes and water and is targeted by specific diuretics as I told you. I told you like, you know, that photograph that there are some areas which is regulated by hormones. Some of the things they just transported paracellularly. Some of the things need uh, ATP to transport. Okay, things like this. So, <clears throat> you can see each anatomic segment of the nephron has unique characteristic and specialized. Function that enables selective transport of solutes in water. For example, proximal tubule is responsible for reabsorbing 60% of filtered sodium chloride and water, as well as 90% of filtered bicarbonate and most critical nutrients such as glucose and amino acids. Again, this one. They are explaining you this part. Okay. Loop of Hande, <coughs> which is this part, what is the main function of this one is, consists of three major segments and location, descending thin limb, ascending thin limb and ascending thick limb. And the important role in urinary concentrating ability by contributing to the generation of a hypertonic medullary interstitial. As I told you, medulla is hypertonic, okay. Medulla is hypertonic. Uh, important role in excreting a dilute urine since it leads to reabsorption of sodium chloride without water, creating a tubular dilute tubular fluid and contributes to reabsorption of calcium and magnesium ions. Then there is distal convoluted tubules which are basically this part. And what is the function of that? It reabsorbs 5% of the filtered sodium chloride. M much of the sodium chloride is already reabsorbed, you know, in the proximal and loop of Hanle. And this one is composed of tight epithelium with little water permeability. And it regulates the pH by absorbing uh, bicarbonate and secreting hydrogen ions, right? Also reabsorbs calcium in response to parathyroid hormones. So simply, guys. This part is the one which reabsorbs sodium, reabsorbs water, as well as is it is controlling the calcium metabolism, right? And then there is collecting ducts, this one. So what is the function of collecting ducts? Simply it regulates the final composition of the urine, important to, for hormone regulation of salt and water balance and reabsorption of sodium and secretion of potassium. Add cortical collecting duct regulated by aldosterone. Okay. Okay. 
So I already told you what is GFR, right? So GFR is simply the sum of filtration across all nephrons. Here it is written 173 liter per day. Make it simple, make it 180 liter per day. 99% is 99% of that is reabsorbed. And the normal urine output, by the way, in uh, Normal adults is around 0.5 to 2 ml per kg per hour. Okay. Normal urine output is around 0.5 to 2 milliliter per kilogram per hour. So, <clears throat> uh, GFR basically, after 40 years of age, you know, it started decreasing. And then it keep on decreasing. So, uh, regarding this slide, you can see that renal autoregulation maintains a constant GFR, whatever the mean arterial pressure it is. So, see, even the blood pressure is, the mean blood, blood pressure is increasing or decreasing. This is what they're talking about is a mean blood pressure, okay. This is what they're talking about is mean blood pressure. I think like by now you must know how to take the mean, <laughs> the mean of anything, right. So see like the blood pressure variations is too much but like due to auto regulation the GFR is maintained at one limit. It, it is not like this that like when the blood pressure is too much high the GFR will become too much higher. Or when the blood pressure will become too much low the GFR will become too much low. No but it is maintained in this way like in, in a good range. Why, how? There is two mechanisms of auto regulation. One is myogenic and one is tubular glomerular feedback. What happens in myogenic, uh, there is release of vasoactive factors such as prostaglandins as I told you that prostaglandins they act on the afferent tubules okay and uh, <clears throat> what the prostaglandins do is basically like uh, the effect of prostaglandins Whenever there is, uh, <clears throat> okay, see, what happens in this one, myogenic, basically there is like, uh, perfusion pressure is there, right, which causes afferent arteriolar constriction and the GFR can be decreased. So whenever, you know, the arterioles are going to, um, are, are to, are, will constrict there will be less blood supply to the kidney okay um, you can see like tubular glomerular feedback so this is basically depends on the sodium delivery to the macula densa so whenever there is increased delivery of sodium to the macula densa cells uh, what happens like it causes aff afferent constriction so when there's afferent constriction decrease blood supply right so this is how you know uh, like the, the like the glomerular filtration, filtration rate is uh, like regulated fraction filtration fraction uh, and this one is like the percentage of renal perfusion, GFR by renal perfusion, right? So it is expressed as a ratio. And normal is a 0.2 or you can say 20%, right? Is the normal filtration frac fraction ratio. Angiotensin, angiotensin 2 constricts renal efferent arterioles, which increases... Uh, the filtration fraction simply guys like it is not a big science what will happen that when this one is constricted so when this one will be constricted so the blood will find difficulty to escape and there will be more more GFR so this is not a rocket science it's very very simple concept so whenever there is angiotensin 2 is there it constricts the efferent arterioles and it increases the filtration fraction and <clears throat> simply by that way you can say maintaining the GFR 
And Renner is also released from juxtaglomerular hepatitis in response to decreased renal perfusion and maintained sodium balance, right? So, of course, like renin is a very important enzyme, as you know, guys. Like, this is RAAS system. Okay, renin, angiotensin, angiotensin aldosterone system. So, see, like, from where the stimulus for renin release from the kidneys is coming, you know, number one, there is decrease in stretch of efferent arteriole. Just a glomerular cell, beta sympathetic nerve stimulation will be there. Okay. So, or receptor stimulation, you can say, will be there. And there's low sodium, or there's low sodium in fluid composition at macular denser. So, what, what these things will do, the kidneys will start releasing um, renin, right? Either decreased stretches there, either there is juxtaglomerular cells, receptor stimulation, or there is either there is low sodium levels to the macular denser. So the kidney will release renin, okay, and uh, renin will be released. Liver is the one which <coughs> which releases the angiotensinogen, which is converted from angiotensinogen one to angiotensinogen two, and basically that is the one which causes vasoconstriction as well as it will go and cause. The adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. Okay, so what this aldosterone will do? It will retain more and more and more sodium, so that this stretch should increase, or there is more and more sodium will reach the macular densa, and simply this system should be shut off. So angiotensin, no, angiotensin two, is the one which causes vasoconstriction as well as increase vascular smooth muscle growth and increase sodium resorption, increase aldosterone, include in, increase bicarbonate products. So th that is how you can say the blood pressure is controlled, or that is how you can say like the sodium um, secretion or excretion is controlled. Sorry, secretion or, or reabsorption is controlled, right? So this is how uh, the blood pressure is maintained. Okay, so. Now, um, before going on to the on to the other things, guys, like uh, I would like to talk about, uh, you know, how we assess the renal functions. Okay. So clinically, clinically, GFR is estimated using serum creatinine. Uh, you know, in physiology, guys, you know, physiology, master physiology, Guyton, Guyton, you know, in Guyton, they, they give the example of inulin, how they measure JFR, they say, like, inulin is the best thing, why? Because, you know, <clears throat> it, is, it, it is like there is no fa less factors which affect inulin. So, but clinically, of course, we, we estimate by something which is produced inside the body, and that is basically creatinine, okay? So, basically the creatinine which is filtered is basically the creatinine which is excreted, okay? So, inulin clearance, it is the gold standard of for measuring GFR, but clinically it is not used, okay? Clinically creatinine is used. So, Whenever the GFR is reduced, guys, it means like the renal functions are declining, simply. Okay. And uh, as we know that, you know, creatinine is a metabolite of creatine. From where the creatine comes from? From the muscles. Okay. So now... What it means if someone have too much muscle mass, for example, a boy, like a guy, big guy, who is going to uh, gym for a long period of time, and he have very much big muscle mass, you know, he will be having a lot of creatine and creatinine. But instead of a female who have less muscle mass, of course, they produce less creatinine. Creatinine. 
is freely filtered at the glomerulus, you know, and there is no tubular reabsorption. So this is a very important point, and that's why whenever we want to check the kidney function, uh, we we check this one. So, <clears throat> tubular secretion of uh, tretinine basically varies uh, and it depends on the renal function. Okay. So, simply remember tretinine filtered is equal to uh, creatinine secreted, you know, at steady rate. So, that's why, why we use creatinine, you know, to assess the renal functions. So, there are different ways to uh, measure GFR. Uh, Again, you know, there are there are many formulas. See this one, Cockcroft called formula. In this one, you know what they do is like creatinine clearance, which is milliliter in milliliter per minute. So how they calculate it is weight in kilograms, one forty minus age multiplied by one point two three divided by serum creatinine in millimole per liter. So if it's you are calculating out with a for a female whatever is the value multiplied by 0.85 because female has left creatinine but no one is going to ask you this equation right so simply uh, there are different ways you know how we can how we can measure creatinine okay so our calculation provides like a reasonable estimate of uh, glomerular filtration rate okay so simply you can see what this one you know glomerular filtration rate per day is equal to urine urinary creatinine okay it's equal to urinary creatinine multiplied by 24 hour urine volume divided by plasma creatinine okay so this is one of the way and of course, like it have like the same thing I told you. It varies from one person to other person. So there is MDRD formula modification in diet of diet and renal disease formula. But simply these are all the ways by which we can calculate the creatinine. Cockcroft called formula I told you. Or <coughs> there is one more equation called as CKD EPI equation but I uh, like this is not our discussion right now okay uh, <clears throat> you know the bad the thing is that uh, creatinine is produced by the muscles right so for example in, in, in injuries like which are damaging the muscles you know uh, what happens like uh, there is a big change in creatinine level. Or for example, someone who have a kidney injury, of course, or acute kidney injury, you know, in that case, of course, GFR will reduce quickly, very suddenly, okay? But the serum creatinine will not immediately reflect the effect which happened on the GFR, okay? So, why? Because see, creatinine is formed <clears throat> by the muscles. And kidneys are the one which are throwing the creatinine out, right? So if anything which occurs acutely, either it's a kidney damage or a muscle damage, uh, or especially when it is a kidney damage, you know, <clears throat> the, the, the muscles are producing creatinine at a steady level, okay? So that, that's the reason, you know, it says, says you know, creatinine excreted is equal to creatinine filter at steady rate. So, of course, like, to maintain the steady rate, of course, there should be uh, <clears throat> the normal balance in the body should be going on. Okay. So, this thing and uh, one of the thing, you know, as I told you that your half million uh, nephrons, if they are working, you know, your kidneys will work fine. So, that's one of the reasons that uh, the GFR will be good or the uh, sorry the creatinine level will be good uh, even like you can say uh, three-fourths of your kidneys are damaged already because one-fourth of the kidneys they are enough to maintain the functionality simply <clears throat> okay so remember <clears throat> 
that if there is any structural damage to the kidney, maybe the GFR is well, like the creatinine levels will be still normal. Okay, so this thing is very important. So simply lower muscle mass like females or elder people, you know, or low weight people like uh, they, they produce less, less creatinine. So a 20 year old man, you know, who weighs 100 kilogram, their GFR will be different than someone, you know, who have, who is 80 year old woman and who weighs 50 kilogram, of course. Okay. Because there are many factors like GFR decreases with age. Okay. And muscle mass of all the people, they, they, that is different, right? So like these are, are the things which are there, okay, and like which by which like we, we had uh, the issues of uh, checking like how many, how much kidneys are working or not, okay. So, but simply guys, whenever we have to see the renal function, functionality of any patient what, or any person, what we are going to calculate is GFR, that's it, okay. So, <clears throat> other thing is urea. So as you know, like, you know, when the proteins are break, broken down, uh, what, what is formed? Urea is formed. Or you can say urea is the uh, end product of uh, what? End product of uh, protein uh, breakdown. Okay. So plasma urea concentration reflects the renal function, but should not be used alone as it is modified by a variety of factors. Now, again, this is the same concept which we are going to learn over here again. See, mm -hmm. uh, uh, urea, like creatinine is produced by the muscle, so urea is produced by the liver, right? And it also <clears throat> changes with the diet. For example, someone who is taking a high protein diet and he is suffering from condition, like also someone who is suffering from catabolic conditions like cancers, so, or sepsis, so someone who is taking high protein diet, of course, their urea level will rise, right? Someone who is taking less protein diet, their urea level will be decreased, okay? So, uh, for example, someone who has GIT hemorrhage or sepsis, their urea will be increased, okay? And someone who is taking low protein diet or someone who has low liver disease, their urea will be less, right? So, urea also changes with these factors, right? So, uh, <clears throat> uh, we always, you know, like whenever we have to check the kidney function, what we do, we check the blood urea nitrogen and uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are also affected by multiple factors, which I already told you. So, typical ratio of urea to creatinine in this one, you can see in the serum is 1 ratio 12 in standard units, right? International standard units using millimole per liter for urea and micromole per liter for creatinine. Okay, and uh, uh, this is the normal ratio, typical ratio of creatinine versus uh, urea is like this one. This one. Okay. Okay. These are the things you know. When the urea will increase and and like the conditions in which the urea will decrease in the body okay so now uh, what is left guys uh, okay the sign and symptoms yeah like common presentations we can start with and then we will when we will study you know what kind of investigations we can do and then we will move forward in discussing different conditions okay by the way level I, I was planning to start directly but then I decided okay we must talk about some of the symptoms you know and then we, we must go uh, like in this way of course so see one of the thing is called as azotemia okay now what is azotemia uh, when the cerium when the urea and creatinine in the body is increased but the patient don't have any symptoms or asymptomatic uremia and creatinemia, okay, creatinemia. 
So when the creatinine and the urea in the blood is raised, but like the patient is still asymptomatic, we call that condition as azotemia. And uh, of course, like it, it, it reflects like when the urine creatinine in the body is increased, okay, and the patient don't have symptoms. So there, there could be multiple reasons behind that. Uh, simply, uh, for example, purely caused by inability of the kidney to excrete urea and creatinine, okay. And uh, if azotemia is associated with the symptoms of kidney failure, like anorexia, nausea, itch, and confusion, then the syndrome of uremia is said to be present, okay. So when urea and creatinine are raised and there is symptoms, we call this thing as symptom of the kidney failure with azotemia is called as what? Uremia. You can see over here what is azotemia, right? And very, very nice, you can say, uh, description is given over here of azotemia. So, basically azotemia occurs in many conditions of the kidney, right? What happens whenever there is azotemia, what is azotemia like? In the body, there is raised creatinine and urea, right? So, what happens in the body is uh, that it is it can occur due to multiple reasons. It could be pre-renal, it could be renal reasons, it could be post-renal reasons, right? So you can see over here, first of all, the pre-renal. For example, someone who have hypovolemia, like hemorrhage, dehydrations, and things like this, what will happen? That uh, mm -hmm. the kidneys will not get, get enough fluid, right? The kidneys cannot filter enough so when the kidneys cannot filter enough how the patient will present the patient will present with azotemia the creatinine and urea is going to raise in the body in the blood okay and that is called as azotemia on the other hand if you will see over here the post renal cause you can see that if there is any obstruction what kind of obstruction is there stones, tumor, BPH is benign, prostatic hyperplasia, okay, they are the one in which like the prostate is so much enlarged that it is going to block the urine formation, okay, and one of the causes of azotemia is the renal causes which we are concerned of right now, which we are going to study, so in this one you can see like there can be glomerular causes like glomerulonephritis or inflammation of the glomerulus, there is renal tubulo interstitial conditions like simply when that when the tubules of the interstitium is damaged one of the thing is called as acute tubular necrosis acute allergic interstitial nephritis chronic tubulo inter interstitial nephritis or pyelonephritis and the third condition is small or large vessel disease like renal artery obstruction renal vein obstruction or intravascular so simply all these things, you know, it is going to lead to rays of um, uh, urea and creatinine in the in the blood, right? So that's how about the causes of azotemia. And uh, uh, in the next lecture. We will discuss about uh, other renal functionality problems, okay? And uh, once we are going to finish that, of course, like we will, we are going to uh, start the other discussions, right? Uh, we will go on to the on to studying. Like in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, the common investigations which can be done in renal conditions, okay? As well as like other 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 symptoms. Like one one thing is azotemia, which you have seen. So why we are studying this thing, you know, azotemia? Because see, if, if uh, you 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 found a blood report of someone who have increased urea and uh, creatinine in the blood, so how you can think of what can be the causes of that? So think we think in this way, okay? We think in this way, like what are, what 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 can be the cause of increased urea and creatinine? 
and then we try to find out the cause okay and of course in this one the most important thing is the renal causes okay though these are also important but this one is very important hepatorenal syndrome basically occurs in liver failure you know so that's all for this lecture see you in the next lecture guys